I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made. I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made. It's easy to say. It's easy to sing. Why don't we believe it? Oh, we do. At least... We believe it intellectually, maybe. You know, it's kind of up there. It just never gets connected to anything in here, the heart. Or we do believe it about the other people. Probably not the people in your own family. Maybe not your own parents or your own spouse or your own children or children their parents. I don't think God qualified it. I don't ever recall in the scriptures God saying anything about you're wonderfully made except or even only if or he just says that we are wonderfully made, that we are his creation. It is so difficult for us to put our hands around that. Well, maybe when we get a little older, maybe it's even easier for kids to do that. But of course, we grow up to be adults. We get real sophisticated. That word means wisdom, but somehow we don't connect it to that either. Wise. We get a little jaded, don't we? Get that little bit of experience in life behind us, and it kind of goes sour, doesn't it? Ah, I used to believe that when I was a little kid, but I don't believe that anymore. It's hard to believe it about people we're close to, people we know well. I think that's the hardest, only because we know each other well. But again, God never qualified the statement. He didn't say, oh, you are wonderfully made, everybody except you and your family. I remember how I always thought other parents were so much better than my mom and dad. Not all of them, but here and there, there was a parent. I, wish, I had an aunt that I really wished, I, I wish she would have talked to my mother more. But when I got older, I realized that my mom did a really good job on me. And quite frankly, I think she did a better job on me than my aunt did on my cousins. Strange. Why can't we believe it? I am wonderfully made. And why do we have to think it's true maybe of some others, but not true of me? I don't know whether we hear wrong messages as we grow or as we're coming into some kind of maturity, it starts to get sort of jumbled in us, but we can't take him at his word. And this is why this feast of the birth of John the Baptist speaks to our hearts. His parents were too old to have children. Surprise! This child was destined for a specific role by God. This child was to be the precursor, the one who went before, the forerunner of the Messiah. We know from the scriptures, from Luke's gospel, this whole story is told in Luke chapters 1 and 2. We know 
that the angel came to Mary and told Mary after she was going to be the mother of God and had said yes, the angel Gabriel says to her, your cousin, thought to be way too old to have a baby, is six months pregnant. And Mary, forgetting herself, which would be her role her entire life, forgetting herself, went to help Elizabeth because she knew in her old age having a child would be more difficult. The child is born. Child's a little weird. Ends up living in the desert. Scriptures tell us eating locusts and wild honey. Dressing in camel's hair. Yikes. Then down by the Jordan preaching. And what is he preaching? Repentance. He's doing the role of a prophet. He's speaking the truth. He's saying to people, get yourselves right by God. Don't live without God. Don't do that. And people who said, okay, he took him down into the Jordan and did a kind of a water bath thing. It's not the sacrament of baptism, but it's a baptism of repentance. And then the day comes. The day for which this man was born. He points to his cousin Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Messiah you have been waiting for. That is the one. And he says many things in the scriptures. I must decrease. He must increase. Many things about his cousin. He had another less important mission, but it was a mission from God. It was to always speak the truth. And he does. And he speaks to the king. And it cost him his life. He becomes a martyr. A martyr for God, for truth, for repentance. The whole mission of his life is God-centered. You know what? Why is it that we can look at somebody like John the Baptist and, and thank God, I don't think I'm being asked to be John the Baptist. I'm really glad I'm living 2,000 years later. Um, but why is it that we can't see those same things about us. Why can't we see that we were wonderfully knit, like the prophet Isaiah said, in the womb of our mothers? And that God, God above all, was the only one who knew what would happen to you and how you would unfold your life. But why do we think that we don't have a mission from God? Why do we think that maybe God doesn't have a plan for us? That we're just sort of like born and thrown out here to kind of flop around and somehow fall into and figure out maybe sort of what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to be. And Why do we think that? Why don't we believe that when, when we were formed, knit in the womb of our mother, that God looked at us and said, you are wonderfully made. You, you're wonderfully made. What a difference it would make in our lives if we would finally start believing what God intended about us and for us. Everybody in this church, actually everybody out there, everybody, that's God's plan looks at us and sees how wonderful we are, how wonderfully made we are. And in his heart, he has for each and every one of us a mission. Some of the missions are probably the same. We're all meant to proclaim his word. 
every one of us, we're all expected to speak for God. Some in little ways. Some, like me, get stuck behind a pulpit sometimes. But others, no. Others, it's just, it's the very words you use with your family, the, the, the way you speak the truth in your own home, the way you speak truth to your friends, even when they don't want to hear what you have to say, even when they speak words of correction to you, or you need to speak words of correction to them, ay yay. We all have that. We all have the mission to be a voice of truth in the world in which we live. That's why the that's why the church in this country right now is celebrating this fortnight for freedom. You know, we're flawed, we have problems, we have issues, don't we? All of us, everybody in this room. We all do. But that doesn't mean that when there's something wrong, we don't speak the truth. We have to speak the truth. It's part of our mission. It's part of your mission in your home. You speak the truth to your children. You teach them right and wrong. You do all kinds of things with them that you need to do. You form them. Obviously, you can't control them once they're gone or what response they make. But it's our obligation to teach that truth. And you young people here, you're not exempt from this. You have friends who are doing wrong things right now, and you know it. And you have an obligation to be a voice of truth for them. How's that for a challenge? Yay, yay. That is hard. Because it's risky. It's always risky. What will they say back to me? They won't be my friend. They won't like me anymore. I won't be accepted. I won't be with the group. I won't be able to go with the flow. Come on. When you and I were knit in our mother's womb, our God had a loving plan for us to live by. And we're called to that challenge to live it. We're called to be his voice, to evangelize others, to bring others to that truth that is God. There were no exceptions. No one was excused from that mission and how hard it is to follow it. We have people, we have a feast like this, why? So that we can remember this, for one thing. But the other thing is, so that we can be strengthened by people like John the Baptist, by his prayers, by his example. That we can be strengthened by God's word. We can be strengthened by the body and blood of Christ that we share here to actually become what God said about us, that we were wonderfully made.